my background is as a musician uh, from childhood. Uh, as soon as I can remember, I got stuffed in piano lessons, you know, dragged down to, <laughs> to do that. And uh, I, I think I was very lucky to have my mother invest in me uh, musically. And I don't know so much if it was she thought that I was very talented uh, or that she thought that she needed some time to herself <laughs> or what have you, but uh, I did piano lessons and I played the saxophone in the jazz ensembles in prep school and then I got into college and I started getting an interest in guitar. And uh, the um, degree that uh, I have from DePaul is in sound recording technology. So at a certain point I decided that I was going to be on the other side of the glass, so to speak. Um, and, and as far as I got started in the recording industry, it was a very uh, easy thing for me to do because it was sort of forced on me in a way. Um, I was very young and I purchased a guitar at a yard sale, a very simple thing to do, a pretty guitar, it looked nice, shiny. Uh, I had no intention of playing it, <laughs> uh, I just simply wanted to have something cool in my room to look at, you know. Uh, and my friend says, oh, you've got a guitar, you know, my, my good friend, he says, you're in my band. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. I don't play. And he says, too bad. You're coming over. And uh, I got involved with a band uh, from a very early age of maybe 14, um, where I was uh, involved with a group called Mark One. Mark-One.com is the address for that band that uh, no longer functions, but uh, we, we did put out two records together. Um, and they are progressive rock theme type albums, primarily for... Uh, really art, artsy folks, <laughs> I suppose. Europeans really like the music a lot. Uh, sold a lot of records in like, France and Iceland and uh, not, not in America. Um, and we had a very comfortable music recording studio that was beyond our, my means anyways, and mostly financed by the drummer. Uh, we had Kyle Jones as the lead vocalist. He's the guy who got me involved in the group. And then Chris Malinsky, uh, the drummer, had, uh, back in 1996 even, the ability for us to go over to his house, work in a fairly well put together recording studio with 24 tracks and CD burning technology, which blew my mind. This is when you put the CD in the case, and then you put the case in the computer, and the CDs were like 20 bucks a piece, so you better not screw them up, you know. <laughs> um, and I worked at a sub shop. I bought myself a, a nice PA system. We played shows. We worked five days a week. Um, and I think that's the best training you can get because it was done in the spirit of friendship, you know. And the studio was always a very fun, fun place to be, and I always look forward to it. As soon as I got out of work, I'd run outside, get in the van, run to the studio. Uh, we, were, we would all set up in the round, and we called our studio the Briar Patch because you could not walk across it. <laughs> uh, so many cables, so much muck. Uh, all you could hope to do was throw things at people. Uh, <laughs> And um, we put out those two records that I mentioned. Um, in 2000, we got a nice little uh, deal with a French record distributor called Musea Records, or Musea, excuse me if I pronounced that wrong. And uh, they picked up our record and uh, distribute it even to this day in um, little boutique record store shops, and we're part of their catalog. And, uh, every once in a while, I get a rogue email from people from like Uzbekistan who, who like our music and all that. Um, and we were fairly well reviewed. And, and lo and behold, uh, Peter Gabriel found us out. And um, we began a little email correspondence with him. Uh, this was one of the m motivating factors for me to continue in the music business was that by grace of whatever, somehow from our little studio in Gloucester, Massachusetts, we got the attention of Peter Gabriel who was gracious enough to write us an email and tell us how good of a little job we were doing and told us not to sign a contract. He told us he'd like to come see us play live. And as you could imagine, we were just freaking out, <laughs> running up and down the halls, didn't know what to do with ourselves. So that, that propel, propelled me to, you know, I, I think that was the ma major motivating factor in me saying, you know, I'm not going to do business or a business degree or I'm not going to do journalism. I'm going to do music. You know, I can do this. Um, uh, as it turned out, we never really capitalized on that, <laughs> unfortunately, for a number of reasons that, that the whole tour that we had planned never, never really materialized, unfortunately. Um, 
but it inspired me to uh, find my way into the recording studio so that I could make better product because I really felt that the records that we had made in our, our little home studio were interesting to listen to and intriguing and all that, but they certainly weren't sort of professionally saleable broadcast quality records, which is what I have a real affection for. I love Steely Dan uh, and Genesis and uh, things that are uh, highly contrived, well-produced uh, art, you know. Uh, not to say that I don't like Bob Dylan, I don't like a little folk, I like things that are out of tune too, you know? <laughs> but uh, my music sounds much like a combination of Steely Dan and Genesis. Um, it's structural and it, it has a lot of production to it. So I got myself um, out of college and uh, into an internship at a recording studio where I was, uh, you know, phone boy, stamp licker, er errand man. Uh, for a while and uh, began working for a private school inside of a recording studio called the Music Industry Workshop. And this private vocational school um, services uh, a different range of students than a college would. The classes at the Music Industry Workshop range from a couple hundred bucks up to maybe four thousand bucks. And uh, you you uh, can study music production, you can study sound engineering, you can study music business and things like that. But uh, uh, what, what my responsibility was when I began was not designing curriculum or teaching anybody. It was just not screwing up basic things like answering the phone. You know? <laughs> uh, later, later on, what happened was my, one of my superiors quit, got a little promotion, assistant sales manager. Another superior quit, moved away, another promotion. I uh, worked my way up to being general manager of this, this small school called the Music Industry Workshop. And I think that is how I ended up here at Columbia. I don't think that there's any other way that I would have been involved in higher education if it weren't for that. Now, running a, a small school was a different experience for me. It's not like running a kitchen or anything like that, like I had done in the past. Um, you got to find the, you know, all the problems with the school and fix it, basically, was my ultimate goal and my job was to ensure the quality of the classes that we were teaching. So this could be, you know, curriculum development, counseling students, um, doing open houses and tours and things like that, finding the right teachers, creating lab activities, grading papers and tests and things like that. Um, and not all of it was my direct responsibility, but um, I was involved in just about everything from the front door to the back door of this small school. And uh, one of the instructors there let me know that there was an opening here at Columbia. Um, and I, uh, you know, I interviewed for it and got the job in 2005. So I'm an adjunct professor, uh, part-time faculty, uh, teach about 18 credits a year, so about nine a semester. And right now I'm teaching the Art and Business of Recording, which is a 15-week uh, seminar for freshmen that is um, topic matter from all across the music business. A little bit of publishing, a little bit of copywriting, a little bit about record contracts. And, and the like, also about radio and broadcasting and music formats, genres in music we talk about. Uh, we talk about music appreciation, a little music history, and a little music theory. <laughs> Wham, you know.